Pioneers program, which brings together media entrepreneurs from 16 different countries from all over the world. And the aim of this program is to improve their viability through a series of webinars, exchange of ideas, trainings, workshops, both online and offline, and also in the end, the publication of a handbook with the main learnings and key takeaways of this process. Since Monday this week, uh, the entrepreneurs are participating in a virtual workshop to discuss topics like fundraising, revenue streams, membership program, audience engagement, and also how to manage the current crisis, how to find eventually opportunities, not only to survive the crisis, but also in a way to grow in these difficult times. For this live stream segment, we asked the entrepreneurs to an unusual presentation. Instead of presenting themselves, they will now present each other in pairs. They know each other for a long time. We organized two uh, physical meetups in uh, Berlin and Hamburg. So they are friends uh, with each other. So we are also uh, curious to know how they perceive each other, what they learned from each other. Each pair will have five minutes, so two and a half minutes, uh, everyone. Uh, Hanna, uh, our colleague, will be the time police. So at the end of the five minutes, we will hear a little bell so that we can finish on time. And we ask the participants to structure their speech uh, around three main questions. What is your partner organization good at? That's the first question. What was their biggest achievement lately? And the third question, which I think equally important is, what did you personally learn uh, from them? So if everyone is ready, let's start the short uh, introductions. The first pair is a fact-checking pair, Laura Zomers from Argentina and Noko from South Africa. Go ahead. Noko, do you want to start or I, or I do it first? I can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my name is Noko Marchato from Africa Czech. Um, I'm here to present uh, Czechiaro. Um, Czechiaro is a non-partisan, uh, non-profit organization uh, dedicating to verifying public discourse, fighting misinformation, uh, misinformation and disinformation, uh, and promoting access uh, and opening data. They fact, check, uh, they fact check claims by politicians and the media and also viral social media content um, and classify their findings into whether the claims are true or false based on the best available data. What they are good at is collaboration. Um, they work quite well with a number of organizations within Argentina where they are based and within the Latin American region and across the globe. They are always comp seeking complementary uh, partnerships, looking for new ways of doing things with other organizations such as my, my own organization and uh, Full Fact in the UK, uh, and also working on developing useful technology uh, to assist the f with the fact checking, uh, enable, enabling fact checkers to fact check quickly and efficiently. They are one of a handful of organizations that use technology to advance the work of fact checkers. Their biggest recent achievement is being uh, regarded as a trusted source of reliable non-partisan information, which speaks volumes in the work that we do as fact checkers towards our credibility. This is a very important and key success factor in fact checking and in media generally being regarded as a credible source. What we've learned from Chequiado is that uh, partnerships are important and also they have a robust uh, schools education program where they teach high schoolers, uh, teach high schoolers fact check, building, up <laughs> building up resilience of young people. That's it. Thank you, Noko. Laura, go ahead. Okay, thank you for that. And then uh, Noko uh, is the executive director of Africa Tech. That is one of my favorite organization in the fat checking uh, movement or work. They are a non-for-profit organization set, set up in 2012. They promote accuracy in the public debate 
as we do, but also in the media and all around the continent since the beginning. They are based when they start, they were based in South Africa, but now there are operations and teams in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal. And what they are, or what they prove in these years is that we have to think fact checking like a 360 degrees and idea or program, not just thinking that we produce quality content and we let it there and that's it. And then they prove that they have real effect and change in the environment of media and also politician in the continent. Um, the main achievement from the last time is that contrary to what happened when they start that any politician pay them attention. Now, most of the main uh, politicians in the, in the continent are knocking their doors and listen to them when they um, publish something or invite them to any event. And I think one of the things that uh, I learned from them is that they have a strategic idea from the beginning, not just thinking about South Africa or about a small group, but thinking how can we start little to have a huge impact in a continent that need more reliable data. Perfect timing, Laura. Thank you very much for these two presentations. We go to two different parts of the world uh, now with a, with a new pair, but uh, both uh, initiatives are investigative and in a way both uh, initiatives cover the same type of issues, of course, like all investigative outlets, uh, basically uh, focusing on corruption. So I'm calling Natalia and Tamara from RISE and Arage. Go ahead. Do you wanna start, Natalia? Yes, I can start. So I was uh, interested to speak about uh, ARIJ. Um, ARIJ uh, stands for um, Arab Reporters for um, Investigative uh, Journalism. It is a media organization uh, that uh, works in uh, Middle East and uh, North Africa uh, regions. What is so special and uh, unique about this organization is that it, it is the leading and the most experienced one to promote investigative uh, journalism in the region. Uh, it specializes in particular in uh, trainings, in organizing training uh, programs for investigative journalism, starting from the basic level to the advanced and to the academia level. Um, another um, thing that makes them um, unique is that they provide uh, mentoring and uh, coaching for investigative journalism, uh, journalists. Um, so what they do is um, they, um, they provide uh, publishing platforms, they uh, establish connections uh, with those platforms, they uh, provide assist assistance in uh, research and um, a lot of the, those investigations have been award winning um, also, uh, another huge event organized by Arij is their um, annual forum. Um, this forum um, combines um, or, or, is, or hosts um, more than 500 uh, participants from over 37 um, uh, countries. And uh, it's a great opportunity for them to network and to uh, connect with um, donor organizations. So hopefully we have uh, some perks with Tamara for the next uh, big event. Um, what I found in common with Arise Moldova, we also do trainings for journalists, but um, of course not at this uh, level. So I think we have a lot of um, great things to, to learn from uh, this organization. Thank you, Natalia. Tamara. Perfect timing. <laughs> okay. so. RISE Moldova is a community of uh, investigative uh, programmers, uh, journalists, activists 
that is based in Moldova. Uh, Rice Moldova produces high quality investigative reports that exert um, pressure on the government by the society, among others. Uh, one of the main achievements of Rice Moldova is they, that they were part of the Panama Papers and uh, the Swiss Leaks. And what I find interesting and fascinating that um, we cover different regions, but we have, we're, you know, basically the same. We have similar partners and we work on the same issues. And, you know, despite the different regions that we cover, we just so much like sister organizations. So, yeah. What did you learn from, uh, from your partner organization? What was the main takeaway? Yeah, I mean, that was the takeaway that we have so much in common, we can learn a lot and we need to connect because we have so much to learn from each other. Uh, in terms of challenges, in terms of achievements, in terms of collaboration. I'd love to invite you to the virtual forum of Arish you just mentioned, and Natalia, and be part of it and learn uh, from, you know, what, what goes on in the Arab world. Yes, I mean, my experience from this uh, process of uh, digital pioneers, because I participated in the first physical meetup in Kiev, is that to see you uh, actually discussing the same issues from various parts of the world and agree on, not necessarily only on the challenges, but also some type of solution. So I'm calling the next pair, which uh, are also from very far corners of the world, very from each other very far, like Georgia and Senegal, Tijan and Lika. And I saw you first meet uh, in Kiev and it was great experiences, experiencing this kind of uh, lively exchange between various parts of the world. So Lika and Tijan, go ahead. Tijan, do, do you wanna go? You can start, no problem. You can start. Oh, okay. okay. Start. Uh, I'm presenting uh, Questa, uh, which is uh, the online media outlet based in uh, Dakar, the capital of Senegal of West Africa. Um, uh, the the Questa is prominent for its uh, long form, reliable and independent journalism. Considering the overall situation in West Africa, Questaf is really doing a real work of in-depth reporting and in-depth investigative stories. Uh, the team, which is TDN, is uh, head of, uh, is not uh, very big. They are, uh, it's a small number of team members producing professional um, uh, product uh, and uh, very, uh, um, of very good quality uh, and uh, the number of materials they're producing, it's um, up to maybe two in-depth materials per week plus an investigative story. Uh, so uh, Questav is also an award-winning outlet and uh, they are prominent for really in-depth and um, long-form journalism. Uh, the way Questav relates to uh, the organization that I represent, which is Chai Hana from the South Caucasus, uh, uniting three countries of the South Caucasus, is again long-form in-depth journalism that we are doing. We also do not focus on news, but more on a slow journalism um, long reads and like in-depth reporting. So I guess this this was very helpful and also coming from the small team myself, uh, TDN's enthusiasm for, for leading Questup was very inspiring. Thank you, Lika. Tijian? Okay, I'm, I'm introducing you to Chai Kana. Chai Kana means the tea house, it's a Persian word. Uh, they are based in Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, I think something <laughs> that was um, impressive is how that small team could have a group of 250 journalists contributing uh, to producing uh, reliable content from different countries. Uh, I think that, that that was something really that, that impressed me uh, when, when because where I am, I'm struggling to have a, a big team and a lot of contributors, so that, that was important. What they good at, and it's really something very important for them, is this idea of building 
a good community of professional journalists producing good and reliable content. I think that's really uh, what makes uh, uh, Shaikana unique. Um, something they're trying to do these days is opinionated short documentaries, uh, different from what people usually uh, see. So they're trying uh, new forms of narratives uh, that, helps, uh, that, 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 that help them uh, be in innovative. Uh, their biggest achievement, positioning themselves as a valuable source of information for media professionals, not only for, for their readers, but for, for, for the uh, media community uh, as a whole. Um, personally, what I have learned is um, when, when I was spying on their website, uh, language should not be a barrier because I've seen that they're working in, in is it four or five languages, English plus uh, some languages of, of, of the reader. So mainly, uh, this is Chai Kaina, the tea house from Tbilisi. Thank you, Tijian. Our next pair is from Ukraine and Brazil. Kirillo was our host in Kiev for the first time. And I remember Gilberto after the meetup rushing to Chernobyl and uh, have a tour, tour in this remote part of the world after the successful HBO, HBO series. So that was also part of our uh, first uh, meeting and meetup. Kirillo, please present first as the first host of our meeting. Hi, everybody. Uh, Gilberto Schofield. Uh, I have a pleasure, actually, to present Gilberto Schofield. This is a great pleasure. And uh, his uh, ag agencia Lupa, which is, uh, which is fact-checking institution, I would say. It's very good in fact-checking. I personally, I, I actually loved, I had a chance to look through their Instagram and it's, it's very good done, very well done. It's simple and uh, informative. Um, also, I learned from Gilberto that they are started to, uh, to move to some uh, relevant fields. From fact-checking, they are start, started to, to move towards additional spheres. For example, they, um, they move to education with help of some um, uh, international donors. During, during the, the coronavirus crisis, uh, they managed to, to, to survive, basically. So it was not easy, but it was not only about survival. They also launched a lot of new products. And uh, what they learned, they learned how to adapt to the situation of pandemics. And, uh, but also uh, Gilberto told me that uh, the workload has increased and uh, uh, what, what, they, what one of their results from that pandemic crisis is that they managed to uh, secure financing for quite a long period of time. So they used this opportunity to, uh, to survive in the future. That's it. Thank you, Kirillo. Gilberto. OK. Uh, well, to me, it's also a pleasure. Kirillo is a friend, a dear friend, a good host in Kiev, of course. And I'm here to introduce uh, Romadsky. I hope this is correct, because I don't speak Ukrainian. Anyway, uh, and Romadsky is an independent radio website and they broadcast today in six regions in Ukraine. Uh, they are getting bigger and bigger. Um, they produce basically audio content, of course, uh, radio broadcasting, podcasting, uh, and they are very influential in Ukraine right now, which is a problematic country as much as in Brazil right now. Uh, and it's an NGO, which turns things a little more struggling to survive in terms of financial, in financial terms, right? Uh, he told me that the, their biggest achievement was to launch 
a very good radio frequency. This is very technical, but I do believe that they became a better radio, if I can say so, if I'm correct. I'm not, I don't understand that much about radio, but the idea is that they now have a better radio frequency so that they can reach a broader audience, you know? Uh, and and I, the idea that he told me that they live today basically on grants, also some sponsorships. And the idea is that being now better in terms of radio frequency, in terms of a broad audience, audience he can also uh, use this uh, technology to improve the commercial performance, which means that the advertising is the next step to you know, make them uh, profitable, if I can say so. And uh, what they, uh, what I, uh, what I personally learned from them is is something very very useful. He told me that the, during the, the pandemic, he learned to delegate some responsibility to the to his team. And this is something because he is very pretty much close to me. He's we are very equal in terms of. We tend to concentrate all the responsibility and then, and then we end up like burned out from, from work. And so he told me that he's delegating responsibility and I am learning with this. Yeah, I think that that kind of learning is uh, actually an added value of this network because you were together in this, uh, you are together in this network, not only representing organizations, but also on a very personal level, you are struggling yeah, how to lead definitely. organization. And some of you come from a journalistic background. So leadership is not necessarily part of your training and part of your education. So this type of exchange on how to lead an organization uh, on a personal level is also a very important part of, of this kind of exchange. Now we have two uh, participants, two entrepreneurs from Asia, Thailand and Thailand um, and and Singapore, uh, Pongpan and Mingxi, go ahead. Um, good, good evening and hello everyone. Uh, I will introduce a new narrative. Uh, new narrative is a movement for democracy, freedom of information and freedom of expression in Southeast Asia. They fight so hard of, uh, for dignity and freedom for people in Southeast Asia. What is something special from new narrative is that this online portal does not uh, provide only online news and academic writings about Southeast Asia, but they also produce podcasts, comics, and a hit-tap video program like the show with TJ Chan. That's why new narrative can draw attention from audience from multi-platform. Um, what I can learn from New Nelati is that New Nelati success for their membership campaign and also got support across continental, not only in Southeast Asia, but support from global level. And New Nelati provide not only English edition, but they provide multi-language content, which local people in Southeast Asia speaking uh, from Bahasa Indonesia, Bahasa Malayu, Khmer, Vietnamese to Chinese edition. Thank you, Pong Pan. Ming Shi, go ahead. Okay, um, so I was covering uh, Pong Pan's organization, which is called Pracha Thai, and it's an independent nonprofit daily Thai newspaper. Um, there is a Thai and English website version of uh, the newspaper, as well as a blogazine that is in Thai. And um, the newsroom has very clear objectives in that they're trying to provide the Thai public with access to reliable news and information relevant to developing and strengthening the democratic functions of Thai civil society, uh, to focus news coverage on the problems, concerns, activities, and accomplishments of local communities, and civil society movements and organizations, uh, to strive for freedom and independence of Thai news media and to promote active public participation in Thai news media. So um, what they're very good at is covering stories that are underreported in the Thai mainstream media, 
we have a very special focus on exploring and exposing what the Thai government regime does. And um, in terms of their biggest achievement, uh, Pong Hwan said that it was basically being able to maintain their audience and maintain the website over the past six years and survive. And I think one of the reasons for this is because uh, Pacha Thai has faced a lot of resistance from the Thai government. And uh, in fact, the office has been raided um, in the past. And um, the director of Pacha Thai was also arrested in 2009 during the raid. And since then, um, the website has also been blocked by the government. And um, there have been further arrests as well. So with all of that in mind, I think it's extremely impressive that Pacha Thai has managed to continue on in one of in one of the most one of the more repressive countries in Southeast Asia as far as media freedom and continues to report on um, you know sensitive topics that relate to the government that people want to know. And um, in terms of Pong Pan himself, he was saying that he is was kind of more focused on reporting in the past but has now moved on to be more of a in a managerial role and kind of looking oh sorry. <laughs> Finish your sentence. That's uh... That's just a warning, not, uh, you, you are not cut. <laughs> not okay. Um, so yeah, now he's in a more collaborative role where he's working with the rest of the team to manage them and also working on memberships. And one of the ideas that he had in terms of memberships that, that they just successfully did was doing a bundle with merchandise as well as um, memberships. And he showed me the calendar that uh, Pachata has done. So I was like, maybe Nina can copy that too. <laughs> But I thought that was quite a cool concept. Um, yeah, so it's a really great organization. Hope that we can collaborate together one day. Thank you very much, Minshi. So what you mentioned is actually really important. All of you are working under very difficult conditions very often. Difficult conditions can be economic, like many parts of the world you are working, but also you are working in repressive or partly repressive environments. And this is maybe something which the next pair can also share, Zenze uh, from Zimbabwe and David uh, from Peru. Again, two faraway places from each other, but a lot of common challenges in terms of managing uh, an independent journalism organization, Zenze. Okay, David, you go first. Sure, well, hi everyone. My name is David Hidalgo and I'm gonna present the project of Senzele. It's called the Center for Innovation and Technology and it's based in Zimbabwe. And it's a space uh, that is focused on providing content and uh, journalistic content to uh, focus it on mar marginalized communities in Zimbabwe. They use uh, the cyberspace and the digital technologies to uh, provide content, a uh, journalistic content content in order to promote the social accountability, uh, democratic governance, and the freedom, freedom of expression in the country. Uh, they particularly use uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and microblogs to uh, uh, disseminate their, their content. And they are focused in, uh, in, in investigations on corruption and other issues that have a social impact, very strong social impact. In 2018, they launched a project uh, that is called affectionately Asake, that means let's build. And this is a very interesting uh, space because uh, it allows the gathering of uh, journalists, uh, young people, uh, artists and activists. Uh, they are, uh, this space allow the, this gathering in order to promote uh, uh, accountability and transparency uh, from the government. And one of the most interest interesting things is that the, during the pandemic, the audience of uh, this project has grown up uh, uh, strongly. Uh, for example, they have uh, usually uh, uh, 200,000 viewers uh, a, month, uh, a week and during the pandemic, uh, this audience grown up to 500,000 people. So it's a very uh, important, uh, uh, it's a very important thing for this program. It, 
one of the takeaways that I would uh, recommend is that uh, the approach focuses on the marginalized people and uh, the approach for, with the audience in order to promote the uh, accountability and all these uh, social issues that it's also some things that we're trying to do in Ojo Publico. Thank you, David. Zense? Okay, uh, David um, works for an organization called Ojo Politico. Uh, I hope I pronounced that uh, correctly. It is basically a digital media outlet for investigative journalism based in, in Peru, Latin America. Uh, it was established in 2014 and their funding is mostly by, by grants. But what I find uh, interesting is that uh, this organization comes up, not only do they do investigations, but they also come up with uh, investigation tools, which they use to, to do their investigations, which is something that are, are, is a learning, uh, what a takeaway for me to say, you don't only write stories, you don't only research, but you also come up with the tools that will help you uh, to, to do this work. So they came up with a tool which is called FUNEL, F-U-N-E-S, and it's an algorithm uh, tool uh, which can actually analyze thousands of documents. So one of their biggest achievements was actually using this tool to analyze a lot of documents from the Peruvian government contracts based on 20 risk factors to warn uh, of potential signs of corruption uh, in the public tender system. So the, the project involved, also what is interesting for them is that the, the project involves journalists, uh, programmers, statisticians, uh, a lot of other people who are not necessarily journalists. So this project that they did actually won the 2020 Innovation Prize uh, of the Stigma Data Journalism Award. And what I would say, I think uh, I've also learned from them is that uh, it is important to, to develop your own tools uh, to use in the newsroom, but it's also important to collaborate not only with journalists, especially in this digital age, but to work with programmers, to work with um, other people to come up with tools that are relevant to your situation. Thank you, Zenze, for presenting Ojo Publico and not Politico. You just mixed two names uh, from the same network. We have Animal Politico also as member of the network. And what is funny is that Tanya uh, was speaking yesterday about uh, plans to extend the brand uh, and extend the animal political brand. So there might be an extension, David, to Peru and Ojo, Polit Ojo Politico will be the next brand extension to animal political. <coughs> One important aspect of this network <coughs> is that if you look at our uh, picture on Zoom, we have a lot of women entrepreneurs uh, in the network. And as Deutsche Welle Academy, we are really proud of this achievement that we could uh, find really successful uh, entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs from all over the world. And the next couple uh, from Guatemala and Kenya, Lucy and Margaret, are prime examples of uh, success. Uh, go ahead. Lucia, Margaret. Lucia, you wanna go first? Okay, yeah. I can, I can, I can do the presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to introduce Nomada, who focuses on investigative journalism and day-to-day -day stories in Guatemala. The Media House was founded in 2014, and uh, they have a team of uh, 14 people. Of these 14 people, six of them are journalists. And um, what are they good at? They're good at explaining complex ideas and uh, investigative uh, journalism, and they use different formats. Uh, this include photography, texts, and uh, interactive, uh, interactive projects. And uh, their biggest achievement was that they won part of the GNI Latin America funds for their membership program. And uh, Lucia, who is the sub-director of uh, design, uh, works with design, which engages in all areas of the organization, journalism, institutional, and, and, and community. She's also currently working on the membership uh, program. The, the biggest lesson for me from uh, Nomada is uh, the ability to keep going, given uh, the current situation with, uh, with the pandemic, uh, that uh, what's important is that 
institutions and organizations are able to adapt to situations other than being, being limited by them. I am particularly interested in their membership program because at the elephant, that is something that uh, we've been thinking about for a very long time. And the mere fact that they've been able to actualize this, I think it will be a positive and a plus for the elephant to learn from them, their best practices, lessons, and successes. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Lucia, uh, welcome yes. back. You have uh, probably again some technical difficulties. Yes. But come back again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you might have missed the first part of uh, Margaret's presentation, but she did a good job, I think. <laughs> Your turn now. Yes, uh, I'm here to present uh, Margaret from the Elephant, which is based in, in Kenya. And uh, um, they are an alternative online media to traditional. And um, what I think um, actually makes um, the elephant very distinctive is the fact that they serve over 170 countries, mostly from Africa. Um, and I think that is really, really impressive. And uh, they work uh, with eight consultants uh, who are part of the editorial team. And so they are also, um, they present the, the, the factual, a content that is usually not shown in, in traditional media. Uh, Margaret, um, like I said, she's the uh, program manager and um, the elephant is, um, is, is based on the ideals of uh, Pan-Americanism and uh, uh, to, to, to put uh, on this, the, the power of truth in, uh, in, in, in the center of the national dialogue. And their biggest achievement has been to keep reporting during the, the pandemic. And they also have a, a lot of different uh, formats. They have, uh, they have cartoons, data stories, video, pod, and podcast. Thank you very much, uh, Lucia. And our last pair, uh, uh, they are from, um, Mexico and Egypt. Unfortunately, Tanya uh, had an emergency last minute appointment which she couldn't uh, manage otherwise, so she cannot be present. I will replace in a way Tanya, so I will ask Alexand uh, questions about Mother Master. But first, Alexand, please uh, introduce Animal Politico in Mexico. Thank you, Attila, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Alexandre, so I'm French, but I work in Egypt uh, for Madame Masser. So I will introduce you with Animal Politico. That's a Mexico-based website. They are one of the first uh, pure uh, digital player in Mexico, uh, historically and also in terms of numbers. And uh, they are one of the biggest uh, news websites with around six to seven million uh, readers. Uh, they will turn... 10 year old soon, so they are quite established now. Uh, they are specialized most in uh, investigation, uh, fact checking and breaking news. Um, and I think their biggest achievement and what they are the most proud of is uh, some of the investigations, especially on corruption and uh, violence in the country. And we know how much uh, doing this thing in, in Mexico is difficult. And I think they exposed uh, major stories uh, across the year and I think that's uh, probably what they are the, the, the most proud of. Uh, they received uh, awards as well, uh, as far as I recall. Um, in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, they have launched a membership program. They already have 1,500 members already, which is a lot. The members get uh, access to website without ads. They can comment. They can receive their, some major pieces in advance. They have events and newsletter, uh, and they actually, uh, the membership, uh, their membership platform got attacked uh, already and someone tried to pay uh, with a stolen card so they could then get later be accused uh, to be funded with illegal funds. Uh, otherwise, they do consultancies, uh, especially uh, trainings in uh, investigation, workshop, and they also do ads. Uh, they also have two other connected media, uh, more on society, entertainment, science, tech, uh, but I couldn't get the names. I'm sorry. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. 
uh, Alexandre. Uh, now I will replace Tanya and will ask you questions. So you will be in this unusual or usual situation to present your organization. I mean, for a lot of people around the world, Madame Asar is there's no need to present Madame Asar because uh, a lot of people know you. But let's suppose someone doesn't know anything about Madame Asar. How would you define very briefly what you are good at as an organization, what you are unique at? Uh, well, we are one of the last independent voices in Egypt, uh, in a country where uh, the whole civil society has been heavily repressed, including journalists. Uh, like Egypt is the second uh, biggest jailer of journalists in the world after China. Um, but we are not only good at investigations. I think we, we do a whole range of uh, content. And I think we are also a space uh, for experimenting in art, in culture, uh, in videos, of course, we are launching podcasts. We are also good uh, with regional content. Uh, so we uncover stories in neighbor countries where also uh, media uh, there is not very developed. So like Sudan, Libya, we uncovered a few stories. Uh, also Palestine to some degree. So that's, I think, in a nutshell. And we also try to be in innovative in the business and institution uh, side. And what was your biggest achievement, let's say, the last couple of months? Well, I think, we, I mean, obviously, the, the actuality is all about COVID. And I think uh, the government uh, now is trying to repress also the doctors uh, who, are, who have been complaining about uh, the lack of safety uh, for them in very poor conditions. So we have uh, some doctors have been put in jail also for trying to raise issues. Uh, some have, are, are forced to work while being sick themselves. Uh, so we are still uh, one of the last to report on, on such issues. And one last question, in a, in maybe in a broader sense, what did you learn from this network, not only from uh, your um, current partner, Animal Politico, but during this process working with the digital pioneers, what was eventually the biggest key takeaway for you as also an entrepreneur and as a journalist? Well, I, I think it's it's the courage of everyone. Uh, and I think for us, where we are, we are like in difficult situation and a bit in our silo, uh, because it's there is a, a feeling of loneliness it's uh, first very, very refreshing and encouraging to meet people who are in very similar uh, situations. Then there are like a couple ideas here and there, especially on our membership program that we, we keep uh, pushing and uh, experimenting with. Uh, so I need to go back to my team and discuss of, uh, some of the ideas. Thank you very much, Alexander. And thank you everyone for uh, their attention. I hope this 40, 45 minutes during this 40, 45 minutes, we could prove that uh, this is a wonderful bunch of uh, entrepreneurs and uh, enterprises and media companies from all over the world who do independent, uh, inspirational and innovative work uh, in the area of journalism. And we are very happy to work with them. Again, this session was part of or is part of the Digital Media Pioneers program. It's bringing together digital media entrepreneurs from 16 countries or from all around the world. And uh, this is a meetup, a four day meetup, which will last until tomorrow evening. Thank you very, very much for your attention.